Hare Krishna Mata Ji, we can start Mata Ji whenever you are ready. Uh, I send the link to the group. We can start. Sure, Mata Ji. Thank you so much. Um, Hare Krishna, everybody. We are going to be discussing chapter six today of Bhagavad Gita uh, in the 18 chapters in 18 sessions uh, series. And we will start with uh, Pranam Mantra. All of you can follow along with me. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya. Please unmute yourself if you want to follow. Jnana Anjana Shalakhaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namo Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Niti Namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashatya Desha Tarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare The meaning of the mantra is O Krishna, O energy of Krishna Please engage me in your service. Okay, with this, we will uh, take a look at what happened in the past few sessions. Um, we saw that uh, through chapters one through five, uh, Krishna is explaining over and over again to Arjuna as to what is the meaning of actual renunciation and what is the meaning of, uh, you know, uh, engaging in. Uh, uh, dharma or in uh, um, activity prescribed duties. So Arjuna keeps getting this doubt over and over again because he's not able to correlate the fact that uh, just false renunciation, giving up of all activities may not actually mean renunciation in the true sense. If you're still, if your mind is still dwelling on the sense objects and you've not given up your desires and your other material engagements, even though externally one may appear renounced, internally uh, the person is still attached. So this takes some time for Arjuna to understand. And uh, towards the end of uh, uh, chapter five, we see that uh, Krishna actually, you know, uh, discusses about how a transcendental person who is in full knowledge uh, acts. And we've seen the same descriptions in chapter two, two two also in chapter three also, and in chapter four, the transcendental knowledge is discussed, but Krishna goes on in an iterative fashion, the same concepts, just to make them uh, you know, more clearer and in depth a little bit at every time, point of time. So again, we see that he, discussing about uh, a person in, uh, who's, in the, who's transcendentally situated, he um, actually cues in or he gives a, a, an, you know, a light, um, a, a glimpse of what uh, this Dhyana Yoga or the next chapter or Ashtanga Yoga chapter is all about. So we see that in the verses 5, 27 to 28, he uh, discusses a person who's situated in Samadhi. So the same theme is actually followed in many of the chapters in Bhagavad Gita, where the last few verses kind of, um, you know, set the tone for the uh, coming chapter, the upcoming chapter. So Krishna kind of hints at a few points which he would discuss later at, in greater detail in the following chapter. So similarly, we find in chapter five towards the end, we see this verse which reads as follows, shutting out all external sense objects, keeping the eyes and vision concentrated between the two eyebrows, suspending the inward and outward breaths within the no nostrils and thus controlling the mind, senses and intelligence, the transcendentalist aiming at liberation becomes free from desire, fear and anger. One who is always in the state is certainly liberated. So we see here that Krishna is actually alluding to this next chapter, the Dhyana Yoga chapter. And he goes on to discuss it in a little more detail in this 
chapter six, which is titled Dhyana Yoga. So the first verse, which is a very important key verse, which sets the foundation because this actually culminates or it, uh, <coughs> you know, summarizes the points discussed in the earlier chapters, reads as follows. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Anashrita Karma Falam Kadhyam Karma Karotiyaha Sasanyasicha Yogicha Naniragli Nachakriyaha The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, one who is unattached to the fruits of his work and who works as he is obligated is in the renounced order of life. And he is the true mystic, not he lights no fire and performs no duty. So he's again reiterating the fact to Arjuna that you falsely renounce all your activities and just sit in a corner and expect that, and think that you are totally renounced. You've given up all material activities. That is not true re renunciation. No, no. True renunciation means one who is unattached to his, the fruits of his work and he actually acts in devotional service. So that is the point Krishna is trying to over and over again uh, bring in, in the Bhagavad Gita. So uh, an example, a lot of analogies are given in this. We look at the two pictures here. We see a person eating uh, prashadam here. So if the, uh, you know, um, there is a story which Srila Prabhupada actually very um, uh, humorously quotes, you know, once the um, limbs of the body, they went on a strike, like the arms were thinking, you know, like, and the legs were thinking, I go to the market and get all this stuff, you know, and the arms were, uh, hands were thinking, I do all the cooking, but this stomach, it happily eats, you know, whatever I make. And um, so they decided to go on a strike and they said, we will not serve the stomach. So you can imagine what happened. So the body grew weaker, the limbs won't work, the arms won't work, nothing would work. So then they realized that even though, you know, uh, it appears that they are doing the service, but uh, unless, you know, the Supreme, uh, I mean, unless the stomach is happy, the whole body actually deteriorates. So this is an analogy given. So unless we serve, uh, uh, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whatever other activities we may be doing, you know, independently of Krishna, actually they weaken us. In um, some other places, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there is an example um, quoted of Arjuna. So uh, Arjuna couldn't actually protect the uh, wives of Lord Krishna. He became weak and he was actually attacked by these group of robbers and uh, he he just couldn't protect the wives of Lord Krishna. So, you know, uh, uh, the, but we see that the same Arjuna was so victorious in the battle of uh, Kurukshetra. The Lord was with him all the, you know, all the time. He just followed the Lord's instruction and the Lord was with him all the time and he won the, and the Pandavas, they won the battle. Right? So we see that when, when we, you know, fail to uh, engage ourselves, our soul or, um, ourselves in spiritual devotional activity, we actually become weak, not only physically, but also, uh, you know, uh, mentally like that. So um, even in another instance in Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada says that uh, the strength of the warriors or the Kshatriyas is more mental strength than physical strength, you know. So the strategy and things like that, you know, if a person is strong and has a willpower, and then he can go fight really uh, fiercely. But if the person is weak at heart, you know, however strong, muscular built a person may be, he may still not be able to defeat the enemy. So similarly, we have to act in Krishna consciousness because that's what will give us the actual strength to pursue things. The other example is of the famous Amrish Maharaja. Ambarish Maharaja, he used all his, um, you know, senses and sense organs in the service of the Lord. Like he used to walk to the temples to take darshan of the Lord with his eyes. He used to, you know, use his limbs to walk to the temples. He engaged in service um, of the uh, deities and devotees with his hands and arms. And, you know, uh, he ate prasadam. So he used pretty much his whole body was used in the service of the Lord. So that is where we are all trying to head to, that uh, we can use all our time, energy, body, everything in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So um, 
Um, so such a person who engages in such service is actually renounced because his mind is already, always situated, actually um, uh, situated on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I think in course of this first verse, I gave you <laughs> the summary of the whole chapter because that's what the last verse of this chapter discusses. And uh, so I think I kind of broke the suspense here. I'm sorry about that. So um, let's see what Krishna has to say next with regard to the yoga ladder. What is called renunciation, you should know to be the same as yoga or linking oneself with the Supreme, O son of Pandu. For one can never become a yogi unless he renounces the desire for sense gratification. So yoga means actually connecting with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Generally, uh, people, you know, uh, uh, associate or, you know, they think that yoga is nothing but a set of uh, gymnastic postures or, you know, um, some kind of uh, meditation and things like that. But Krishna very clearly defines here, he says, um, what is called renunciation you should know to be the same as yoga or linking oneself with the Supreme. So that is the definition Krishna gives for yoga. That is linking oneself with the Supreme. We also saw in the second chapter, Krishna establishes towards the end of a few verses, uh, yoga karmasu kausalam. He also says karmasu kausalam, the art of doing work or the art of karma yoga or the pinnacle of karma, you know, doing karma or karmasu kausalam the art of work is nothing but yoga, yoga, karma, sukhasa. He also declares this in second chapter. So on the right, we see a picture uh, which actually shows this uh, yoga ladder. On the left is the express elevator, which is actually given to us by Srila Prabhupada, our um, Guru Varga, the Acharyas. And on the right, we see the progressive yoga ladder. So we see that people who may be on the animalistic platform, they don't even follow the Vedas. They don't have the idea of scriptures or any knowledge of God. So they are considered the lowest platform or the lowest rung of the ladder on, in animalistic life. And next, I'm, I'm discussing the progressive yoga ladder, the middle path now. And then people who uh, you know just work for, um, their sense gratification, you know, they believe work is worship and things like that, but they're only, uh, you know, uh, believing in sense gratification. Those people are called karma kandis. And sakama karma yoga, the yoga is actually introduced in the third young rung of the ladder. When that person has some knowledge of the scriptures and, you know, he understands that everything must be used for uh, the service of the Lord, but still he is kind of attached to the, uh, Sakama means he's attached to the fruits of his uh, labor, you know, but then he engages in sacrifice so that he can uh, appease the demigods and the Supreme Lord. Next stage is Nishkama Karma Yoga, where this person is not actually interested in the fruit, but still he has some attachment to the activity itself. So that kind of person is in uh, Nishkama Karma Yogi. And then, um, and then uh, when the person surpasses all this stage and he works purely for the pressure of the Lord, that is called Prema Bhakti. And the one stage before the Prema Bhakti is Bhava Bhakti, when the person gets a glimpse of the Prema Bhakti or the true love of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it is called Bhava Bhakti. So this is a progressive yoga ladder and on the right to it, more details are given. But the problem with this ladder is that you could fall off you know, any, any point of time. Like sometime perhaps you're uh, engaged in Jnana Yoga and you just get carried away by speculative uh, um, you know, studies and things like that. And you, you, you could get diverted you know, uh, from the end aim of actually pleasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The same with Ashtanga Yoga. Many people may be carried away with all the mystic powers they get and uh, they may not actually see the real end of establishing the personal relationship with the Supreme Lord. So these are the uh, yoga ladders which you know, uh, go step by step. But then Srila Prabhupada and our Acharyas, they have given us this express ladder. So a devotee, 
he starts off with sadhana bhakti and sadhana bhakti is where the devotee you know he tries to engage himself under the direction of guru and vaishnavas um, to please or engage in the activities that please lord krishna so he's training himself to get to that mood where he will automatically um, um, you know enter raga nuga bhakti or bhava bhakti spontaneous devotion so you know what one is starting off as a routine you know at the order of the guru okay i have to do this i have to wake up at four i have to chant my rounds i have to you know follow the four regulated principles so one starts off like that and a sadhana bhakti and then you know as one goes through this it becomes second nature and spontaneous love for krishna uh, begins to arise and uh, the person you know in, doesn't no longer he he uh, does not think any longer that oh i need to do it for krishna but he actually develops that real taste that oh i would love to do this for krishna like that and then when he advances like that he reaches the prema bhakti the pure devotional service or the pure love of godhead so this is the express elevator because like i said when we engage in jnana yoga or ashtanga yoga we may fall off you know like uh, there could be distractions but uh, yes as a devotee we also experience distractions but then we have the support system of our guru and uh, the association of vaishnavas to keep us um, um, you know on the path and so this is considered the express elevator because from stage 1 your mind is being trained to engage in the so your mind your body everything is being trained to engage in the service of the lord so you're not practicing some gymnastic poses you're not practicing some breathing exercises you're not doing those kind of things but um you are engaging in devotional service right from the start you're trying to train yourself that way okay for one who is a neophyte in the eightfold yoga system work is said to be the means and for one who is already elevated in yoga cessation of all material activities is said to be the means so this beginning of the ladder is called yoga rurukshu stage and the highest rung the um, perfection of yoga is called yoga rudha a krishna conscious person however is situated from the beginning on the platform of meditation because he always thinks of krishna and being constantly engaged in the service of krishna he is considered to have ceased all material activities so that is the advantage of this express yoga ladder which prabhu has given us <coughs> next we'll see what are the four the in the next following verses the eight stages in ashtanga yoga are discussed i will not go into too much detail as this may take a whole class or perhaps more so we'll just briefly see what these eight stages are yama which are the negative uh, disciplines like for example i'll just give an example um, you know supposing uh, we have we see two children studying you know for the exam so uh, one child he he or she sacrifices you know his play time his video time or tv time or whatever you know his play time with his friends and studies hard and you see that other child does not want to sacrifice anything like that and he wants to play and he wants to run around and do such things and we see that the result is that the person who sacrificed actually uh, gets better grades you know than the person who uh, than the child who actually does not make any kind of sacrifice so we have to from the beginning of our lives we see that you know nothing comes easy unless we put in some effort unless we give up some things you know uh, we don't achieve things uh, easily like they say in english what comes easily goes easily so unless you put in work we have all experienced that whatever we achieve you know with hard work it stays you know for us, uh, with us for a long time but what comes easily it also goes away easily so we need to in the beginning we need to keep away from all these uh, don'ts like you know for example when we start off our devotional life uh, we are given four regulative uh, uh principles which are all the don'ts right no meat eating no illicit sex um, no gambling like this we have all no 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 and then we get one do you know when we accept the guru maharaj or even through shiksha guru or through devotees the first do we get is engage in chanting 
So that is a positive niyama. And then slowly we get the other dos, you know, like engage in some service, engage in, you know, try waking up early in the morning and doing chanting during uh, the early morning hours, study upon Bhagavatam, uh, attend the Bhagavatam classes, attend Mangal Arati, do Tulsi Arati. You know, these things, the do's keep adding up, right? Once we kind of have some grip over the don'ts, the do's keep coming and the do's never end, do they? So, um, so this way, um, you know, like in Ashtanga Yoga too, there are some do's and don'ts a person has to follow. And that is the first step in mind control because unless the person does not control the mind, he's not able to go on to the next uh, stage, which is posture or body control. So why does a person have to go through this body control, you know, and just sit around like this? Because this yoga and meditation on the Lord, this Ashtanga yoga is a long and lengthy process. And if a person is fidgety, you know, I'm not able to sit for even two minutes in proper posture, how can he, uh, he or she divert his mind or take his mind away from all the material, um, uh, you know, distractions around him or her. So this posture or body control is uh, practiced, you know, until the person is able to sit for long hours so that he can move on towards the meditative stage towards the end. So then the pranayama or the breath control is practiced. Why is this breath control practice? The breath control is important because like I said, this yoga, Ashtanga yoga takes long time. And we know that we are, when we are born, we are born with a certain number of breaths. And uh, when we complete the number of breaths, we all automatically uh, uh, you know, uh, pass away from this existing body. So when this yoga process takes such a long time, it is important that you don't lose your breath, you know, in breathing heavily like that. So we also saw in chapter five, the sacrifice. Also, we read earlier uh, in the verse from chapter five, when I read in the recap se session section, we saw that, you know, the um, yogi, he sacrifices his outgoing breath for the incoming breath, right? Uh, breath like that. So that's what it means that, you know, you're trying to control your breath so that you can live a longer duration to meditate on the Supreme Law. So once the yogi, he attains this body and breath control, then the state of actually pratyahara, he tries to close himself or shut himself off from the surroundings and concentrates on his inward senses like you know on he tries to concentrate on the super soul in the heart he tries to concentrate he tries to shut himself outside of the whole system like he is distracted from i mean he is like totally uh, oblivious of the surroundings and at that day, uh, stage he tries to concentrate and gets into the meditative absorption of the supreme lord and finally, he goes to the stage of samadhi or union where he is totally oblivious to the surroundings and is totally with Krishna. So these are the eight stages in Ashtanga Yoga. So this chapter, as we see, it deals with how we can get to this meditative state, you know, or the state where the mind is totally controlled, the body is listening to you, it's able to sit for such long hours and the mind is able to concentrate and go into meditative absorption and we see uh, Krishna goes on to explain how it actually the whole thing works. He first discusses the characteristics of the mind. So this is a very famous verse. Uddhare atmanam naatmanam avasadet atmaiva hyatmano bandhu atmaiva ripuratmanaha. One must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. So we see that this mind, uh, I mean, we all have enough experience of this fact that the mind could be a friend or could be an enemy. You know, sometimes we see that our mind plays games with us, especially when there is a lot of sense gratificatory activities, activities around us. We tend to, you know, steer towards those activities and, um, I mean, even a simple example, right, you know, like um, maybe going to the temple for a darshan, we can come up with any sort of excuse, oh, it's COVID, you know, I don't want to get infected, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. 
um, you know, or I have too much work at home today. I'm just too tired. Maybe next week, you know, like the mind always plays this kind of a devil and it tries to dissuade us from spiritual activities. So the best thing a, a person, you know, a Krishna conscious person can do is to make the mind the friend, you know, his friend and not his enemy. And, uh, but if he, if this uh, mind gives in to this sense organs, it actually becomes an enemy towards the spiritual path, right? So we see that for him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends, but for one who has failed to do so, his mind will remain the greatest enemy. For one who has conquered the mind, the super soul is already reached for he has attained tranquility to such a man, happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor and dishonor are all the same. So a person who has conquered the mind, you know, he is actually oblivious or he is actually, um, uh, he uh, poses equanimity towards any situation, towards the dualities of material life, as we see. So uh, Krishna gives the characteristics of the mind that the mind can be your best friend or the mind can be your enemy. So choose wisely and train your mind. Then we move on next to the symptoms of a person who has conquered the mind. So there are two symptoms, two stages which are described for a person who has actually conquered his mind. One is the internal cleansing or you know, when the person looks inside of himself, that is stage one. For one who has conquered the mind, the super soul is already reached for his attain tra tranquility. To such, okay, we read all this. To such a man, happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor and dishonor are, um, let me go back, some stories um, are all the same. Sorry, there was some typo there. Okay. A person is said to be established in, uh, uh, such a person is said to be established in self-realization and is called a yogi or mystic when he is fully satisfied by virtue of acquired knowledge and realization. Such a person is situated in transcendence and is self-controlled. So this person is actually seeing everything around. Uh, I mean, he is able to tolerate all these urges of dualities, you know, within himself. So he, uh, such a person is actually uh, uh, attain tranquility as this uh, stage one says. He sees everything, whether it's pebble, stone or gold as the same. So this is the internal mindset of a person who has uh, actually conquered his mind. Then we see in stage two, a person is considered still further advanced when he regards honest well-wishers, affectionate benefactors, the neutral meditators, the envious friends and enemies, the pious and sinners, all with an equal mind. So now we see how his dealings are with the um, other people around him and uh, towards friends or enemies or anybody around him. So first stage is when he is totally satisfied within himself, Atmara. And the second stage is uh, when how he deals with the others. We also seen the same points kind of being touched upon in chapter two. Also, like how does a transcendental person, uh, Dhira, how does he walk? How does he sit? You know, uh, those kind of symptoms are already discussed um, in chapter two towards the end. So we see that the same concept is being again discussed by Lord Krishna here. Mind is like fire. When it is controlled, it can make miracles happen. When out of control, it can burn down everything inside. So this is, uh, I'm going to skip this slide because um, we all know the ill effects of an uncontrolled mind. Um, in Kali Yuga especially, we all are going through battles with our mind day in and day out because of so much distraction and our tendencies to engage in material uh, activities. So it is, it's, it's no joke, you know, every moment of life we are trying to control our mind and kind of pulling it back towards Krishna consciousness. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, this again is summarizing the same points we discussed earlier. So for the person who has controlled the mind, the super soul is already reached and he is tranquil. Tranquil means he is peaceful. 
And then the more advanced stage, he sees everybody around him with a very neutral and uh, equal outlook. So that is what we discussed in the previous two slides. So I think it's a repetition. Uh, next, we will move on to the next section where the mechanics of Ashtanga Yoga are discussed. What I mean by mechanics here is what actually is done as part of Ashtanga Yoga. And in this, the first part we see here is posture related. You know, what, what does a person do uh, when he first starts off Ashtanga Yoga practice? We see those kind of posture related mechanics here discussed in the following few verses. Text 10. A transcendentalist should always engage his body, mind and self in relationship with the Supreme. He should live alone in a secluded place and should always carefully control his mind. He should be free from desires and feelings of possessiveness. So this is a general description of what to expect in the future verses. So now the posture or the mechanics are, <coughs> are discussed. To practice yoga, one should go to a secluded place and should lay kusha grass on the ground and then cover it with a deer skin and a soft cloth. The seat should be neither too high nor too low and should be situated in a sacred place. The yogi should then sit on it very firmly and practice yoga to purify the heart by controlling his mind, senses and activities and fixing the mind on one point. One should hold one's neck, uh, one's body, neck and head erect in a straight line and stare steadily at the tip of the nose. Thus, with an unagitated, subdued mind, devoid of fear, completely free from sex life, one should meditate upon me, that's Krishna, within the heart and make Krishna the ultimate goal of life. Thus, practicing constant control of the body, mind and activities, the mystic transcendentalist, his mind regulated, attains to the kingdom of God or the abode of Krishna by cessation of material existence. So we see how a person, a yogi must sit how he should be seated, how, must, how his uh, seat must be, how should his posture be. All these tips are given here in these few verses. This is um, very factual, so I'm not going into details because there's no philosophy, it's just factual description of how a person must, yogi must sit and what he, how he must hold his neck and things like that. Next, we will go on to the mechanics of Ashtanga Yoga, lifestyle related. Let's see what Krishna has to say in regards to how we should modify our daily activities and things like that. There is no possibility of one's becoming a yogi or arjuna if one eats too much or eats too little, sleeps too much or sleep or does not sleep enough. This is a key verse. So I would just like to read the, where is that was Yeah, uh, that is verse 17, yeah. Uh, uh, he who is regulated in his habits of eating, sleeping, recreation and work can mitigate all material pains by practicing the yoga system. So this is verse 17 from chapter six and this is one of the key memorization verses. So I would like to read the Sanskrit for it. It's not on the screen though. Yuktahara viharasya Yukta Cheshthasya Karmasu, Yukta Svapnava Bodhasya, Yogo Bhavati Dukkha. So it's a beautiful verse which says that, you know, some people, sometimes uh, we uh, kind of go in a devotional frenzy, you know, and we are just fasting and we are, you know, trying to, we are putting our body in, uh, in too much distress. And uh, we will see in... Uh, um, um, in one of the later chapters in Bhagavad Gita, I'm not exactly remembering, is it 16th or 17th chapter, where, you know, Krishna says that uh, a person who acts whimsically, you know, who, who takes up austerities whimsically just to, you know, please his mind, uh, is actually uh, not performing any kind of devotional service. He's actually causing more harm to himself or his body. So we must be regulated in our habits of eating. Supposing we are fasting, it should be on a, with, uh, you know, uh, on a scripturally prescribed uh, day, like for Ekadashi, you know, we may fast. 
and um, the the aim or the goal end of, goal of this fasting must be so that we can concentrate all our mind our energies everything um, to the uh, in the meditation of the supreme lord not that you know uh, um, we just fast and sometimes there is this tendency you know we want to uh, perhaps uh, um, you know shed a few pounds here they get fit or something like that and we you know take advantage of this fasting and say okay i'm going to do some body cleanse you know this ekadashi i'm trying to do this cleanse <coughs> so that is not a very good mindset to do such kind of tapasya for uh, the lord uh, just give me one second i just need to get some water um so um that's not a good uh, motivation you know to do this kind of or for some material purposes uh, yeah so it is not a uh, uh, it is not a good uh, uh, you know idea to fast for you know to achieve some material aims or material goals in life but the idea should be uh, to regulate our habits of eating and sleeping and work and recreation so that we can concentrate our energies in the service of the supreme lord so um, so that is very important this is a very key verse then we'll move on to the next verse when the yogi by practice of yoga disciplines his mental activities and becomes situated in transcendence devoid of all material desires he is said to be well established well established in yoga as a lamp in a windless place does not waver so the transcendentalist whose mind is controlled remains always steady in his meditation on the transcendence transcendent itself so we see that the analogy of a lamp in a windless place is given how it you know holds steady similarly for a transcendentalist whose mind is controlled uh he always remains steady in meditation on the transcendent self so how does the mind come to control the answer is given there that is when the person is able to fully meditate uh, on the transcendent self and also this will be explained towards the end of the chapter by lord krishna as to what this uh, um control of mind actually means will be discussed in the later few verses also next we see prabhupada explains in one of the uh, purports in these verses he explains that the devotee is already on the platform of a yogi we saw earlier the slide of the uh, you know the uh, the yoga ladder slide if you remember we uh, the devotees are on the exp- on an express elevator path while the uh, uh, you know while others may be following a step by step you know path of the yoga ladder so why is this devotee devotee already a yogi because regulated eating sleeping work and recreation because a pure devotee of the lord um, he is only he or she is only krishna prasadam and he maintains sleep timings he wakes up for mangal aarti and he works for the pleasure of lord krishna and recreation for a devotee mainly is going to the holy dhams you know um, they take a break from their devotional service assigned devotion whichever they do you know on a routine basis and then they go on yatras or they go to holy dhams and that is considered as recreation for devotees so devotee is prasadam or he gets a higher taste and enjoys serving uh, lord krishna does not uh, Uh, waste time so this avyartha kalatvam it's a very important concept which is discussed in the bhakti rasamrita sindhu um, by uh, rupa goswami in much lot of detail this avyartha kalatvam is one of the symptoms of a pure devotee so this is very important he does not waste any time you know the devotee is always looking on looking out for ways to serve the lord how to preach how to actually engage in the service of guru and gauranga and he is able to practice yukta vairagya that is he is able to use everything around him he sees uh, with the vision of how to use in the service of the lord like we also saw was it in chapter 4 or yeah i think chapter 4 right that uh, or was it 5 
Pandita Samadarshina verse. Of that verse, we see that um, a person, a learned person, he actually sees everything or every, everybody around him with an equal vision. So that is actually a, the devotee is already a pandita, you know, because when a devotee sees another person, what is he actually looking for? He is looking for how that person can be engaged, you know, in the service of the supreme lord. So this devotee, uh, he has the samadarshina. He is actually the best. Uh, friend to all the other living entities because he is looking out for ways and means to actually get the person engaged in divorce in other people engaged in devotional service. So he's actually a very good friend. He does not have any enemies around him because his aim is only that, you know, how do I get that person somehow attracted to Krishna? So the devotees are um, considered best friends because, and they don't have any enemies because of this great quality that they're ready to give Krishna wherever they see, where who, whoever they see. So always they are looking for how to engage a person in devotion service. So that's why he has Samadarshina. He doesn't look like, oh, he doesn't look for the skin of a person, the race or a background or, oh, okay, does this person, you know, actually uh, come from a Brahminical family? Do, can he pronounce Sanskrit properly or can he, you know, uh, does he come from a wealthy family? No, he's not looking for such things. He's just looking to see how I can give Krishna, you know, the love of Krishna to this person. The devotee is equal to everybody in that aspect because he's trying to give the love of Godhead. Faith and determination. So, okay, now we know what are the mechanics of yoga. How does a person, you know, uh, have to sit and do all these things? But what else is required? We need faith and determination, right? To go through this process. It's not easy, right? To sit in a posture for a long time, to control our breathing and, you know, do pranayama for a long time. So what is this next step, which is important as faith and determination in practicing this yoga? Gradually, step by step, one should become situated in trance by means of intelligence sustained by full conviction. And thus the mind should be fixed on the self alone and should think of nothing else. <coughs> From wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering and unsteady nature, one must certainly withdraw it and bring it back under the control of the self. So we have also seen this example, you know, of the uh, tortoise, right? In the second chapter, uh, how the tortoise, it retracts its limbs, you know, in the, uh, when it senses danger, it retracts its limbs. Like that, this yogi, uh, he also is able to control his senses and be steady, you know, in his meditation on the Supreme Law. Thus the self-control yogi, constantly engaged in yoga practice, becomes free from all material contamination and achieves the highest stage of perfect happiness and transcendental loving service to the Lord. So faith and determination is required to pursue through this strenuous process of yoga. Naturally, the question arises in our heart or in our minds that doesn't it sound so difficult? Yes, we are all thinking of the same, right? I mean, imagine sitting for so many years, you know, um, trying to do austerities. Like Dhruva Maharaja, he uh, was uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, breathing once in six months or something when he was trying to meditate um, on the super soul as advised by Narada Muni. He was breathing just once in six months. That's what I read recently. So doesn't it all appear so scary? We'll see how Krish how Arjuna also is having these same doubts and, you know, uh, how Krishna answers them in a, a few, uh, down a few slides. Next, Krishna discuss, discusses the vision of a true yogi. So how does the true yogi see or how does he look at things around him? A true yogi observes me in all beings and also sees every being in me. Indeed, this, uh, okay, me refers to Lord Krishna here. Indeed, the self-realized person sees Krishna, the same Supreme Lord everywhere. For one who sees Krishna everywhere and sees everything in Krishna, um, Krishna is never lost, nor is he ever, nor is this duty or this person ever lost to Krishna. So this, um, this is that stage of, you know, Samadhi, where this, uh, this, is, this is being discussed, where the person, uh, a true yogi, you know, after this meditative uh, trance, when he goes into deep meditation, he actually 
realizes the supreme personality of godhead and he sees him the supreme personality in all beings and he is not able to um, you know dif differentiate between uh, one person or the other we have all heard of this uh, uh, a great personality shukadev goswami uh, he actually uh, um, had a long gestation in his mother's womb and when he uh, came out of his mother's womb he was uh, 16 years old and uh, he was a self realized soul totally oblivious to everything and so he walked around naked you know like uh, he didn't look though he was 16 years he he was unswayed by anything like there was a pond he passed by where some uh, women were bathing and you know they didn't bother to even cover themselves up but his father vyasadeva was following him but when the women saw vyasadeva they tried to cover themselves up so he was so transcendently situated that everything around him he couldn't make any difference between men or women or you know uh, things like that so he was so absorbed in the supreme absolute truth so such you know when a person reaches the stage of samadhi he or she is so absorbed in the supreme lord and that he sees everything around everything looks the same to him or he sees the supreme lord in everything he sees everything as a, a manifestation of the energy of the lord like um, even there's an example of a um actually uh, yeah yeah this one example of shila prabhupada you know when uh, he uh, i'm trying to remember um he was um uh, yeah he was on a flight watching a movie or something like that and something came up in the movie and uh, the first thought that came to shira prabhupada's mind was how he, that could be used in krishna consciousness so you know like a devotee even though externally it may appear that a person is engaging some kind of a mundane activity but the consciousness is so fixed on krishna that everything the person sees or watches he tries to relate to krishna and how he can he or she can use it in the service of krishna like that so a person who is on this high level of you know samadhi he actually sees everything around as a um, manifestation of the energy of krishna and he sees uh, krishna in everything and to such a person krishna is never lost and this person is also very dear to krishna he is also never lost to krishna that's what krishna is saying here friend of all we discussed this already perfect yogi yogi compares himself to others understands the cause of distress and happiness strives to distribute happiness to others friend of all know in your selfishness so what is this strives to distribute happiness to others so are we engaging in yeah we do see several programs like prashadam distribution and things like that but on a more uh, you know higher level uh, like you know shri prabhupad used to say prasadam distribution is good uh, like um, it is you know um, we are giving the mercy of the supreme lord to everybody but prabhupad if we see the principles of iskon four of the seven are towards disseminating this um, supreme knowledge um, uh, you know uh, to make people to be uh, to become top class brahmanas who can educate everybody else and bring them closer to krishna so this preaching you know this preaching is a uh, so important it's an important aspect of krishna consciousness and it's no wonder that shila prabhupada wrote so many books you know he he just slept for a couple of hours and uh, the rest of the time he was uh, translating books and he was writing books he was uh, dictating commentaries and things like that so this uh, Uh, like mundane welfare activities many organizations do it right we see around us many there is like um, the red cross society and so many you know organizations which feed the hungry the poor and things like that but this special gift of giving krishna the supreme love of godhead that is very rare right we don't see many people doing that so that is our mission or our aim you know that is the highest service we can do okay we can you know perhaps uh, give some uh, clothing to a person some food for some time you know we can help somebody <clears throat> you know go through their material uh, um, um, struggles or something like that but what about the next birth again if we don't give him the science of krishna 
he's again going to take birth and next janma he's going to be suffering the same situation right so the aim is to give the highest goal to the other people so that's why a devotee is considered the highest he is the best yogi because he gives this pure love of krishna and sees to it that this person does not come back into the material world to suffer more so that is the, why the devotee is considered the highest yogi so uh, he is a friend of all because he is actually giving the true wealth there um next we'll go on this is a short question and answer like i said how we had uh, you know we also get some doubts that this process appears so you know strenuous and um, so strict you know how can i or follow this kind of a meditative ashtanga yoga process so we'll see what are the questions posed by arjuna oh madhusudana arjuna said oh madhusudana the system of yoga which you have summarized appears impractical and unendurable to me for the mind is restless and unsteady the mind is restless turbulent obstinate and very strong o krishna and to subdue it i think is more difficult than controlling the wind so it is chanchala himana krishna very famous verse lord shri krishna said o mighty army o mighty armed son of kunti it is undoubtedly very difficult to curb the restless mind but it is possible by suitable practice and by detachment abhyasena to kaunte ya vairagya so he gives two solutions to how to control by suitable practice that's why these yogis you know they are trying to hold their breath they are trying to reduce the number of breaths we we saw right different things they are trying to do they are trying to sit in a posture they are trying to uh do pranayama then you know all these things are being done because it's very difficult to go through this process and it takes a long time and also it because it's very difficult it needs lot of practice and detachment so that's why they do all these processes to actually um go through this yoga but nonetheless it can be achieved by suitable practice and detachment so it is indeed a very tough process there is no doubt to it um as we see lord krishna is saying it it is undoubtedly very difficult but it can be possible by suitable practice and detachment but luckily for us we have the express elevator and uh, we have the um, guidance of our acharyas who have uh, who actually guide us from day one on this bhakti yoga path so all this comes naturally you know to us to a devotee okay this next picture is uh, actually um, um you know a picturization of a verse from katha upanishad um the five horses which we see here are actually um, um compared to the five senses and then the reins or the you know like the ropes which the charioteer is holding from these horses that is the mind so our senses you know always try to go here here you know here and there <coughs> after sense objects so the mind must be used to control these senses and how is the mind driven the mind is driven by the intellect or the buddhi or the intelligence and that is the driver in the seat we see the mind is the driver and uh, i mean the intelligence is the driver because when you have good intelligence it it directs the mind to do the right things when you have bad intelligence it actually you end up doing the wrong things right because the mind is like oh i love um, you know um i see that um, you know for especially supposing you know say there's a thief and the thief thing oh i see that uh, precious jewel there i want to go steal it steal it the good intelligence actually you know when the intelligence is good it says no uh, thieving is wrong stealing is wrong you shouldn't engage in this but then the bad intelligence says that no go do it it's okay nobody will see you you know you not get caught it's okay just keep doing it until you're caught like that so that's the bad intent so this intelligence can drive the mind you know and then the passenger or the higher self so in in the cases where you know the consciousness of the person is so much covered by all this material uh, you know uh, outside material tendencies this um atma it takes a lesser role you know this uh, false intelligence or this contaminated intelligence and mind and senses they take over the soul but as in uh, more the more we engage in spiritual activities 
the soul actually shines out, you know, from this covering. It gets rid of uh, this covering of this um, uh, ignorance, this uh, tamaha in this uh, material nature. And then when it is totally connected to the spiritual, uh, I mean, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we get the right directions, you know, to do the things. We get the advice of the super soul to carry out our different actions and things like that. But until such a time, the soul is actually overpowered, you know, it's kind of covered. Like Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he says in the Shikshashtakam, Chaitodarpanam Acharam Bhava Maha, Davagni Nirvapanam. So this cleansing of the Cheta is required so that, you know, we can uh, cross over this uh, material uh, samsara. So this is this uh, analogy or this is description is from the Katha Upanishad. Okay, Krishna's conclusion. Mind control is a must for yoga. Mind more uncontrollable than the raging wind. Yoga impractical. And we saw that it is plausible through suitable practice and detachment. And Prabhupada goes on to say in the purport that the best practice in this age of Kali Yuga is chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Mantra, the word means uh, to liberate, you know, the mind, you know, to free the mind. So this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is actually the best solution to all these um, problems which we have, you know, to deliver our mind from all these evil things. So the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the best practice. And without mind control, the yoga, yogi cannot be successful. This is what is discussed. Okay, let's move on to the next section. So what is the destination of an unsuccessful transcendence? So we saw so far, uh, because we started five or six minutes late, I just am taking five or six minutes extra, okay? I promise I'll stop soon. Um, so destination of an unsuccessful transcendentalist. So we see that this process is not easy, right? It's, it's really a tough process, right? To sit for so long, you know, uh, in a posture and do all these things. So um, what is the destination of a person who is unsuccessful? This is the next question which arises in the mind of Arjuna. Arjuna says, oh Krishna, what is the destination of the unsuccessful transcendentalist? Who in the beginning takes to the process of self-realization with faith? but who later desists due to worldly mindedness and thus does not attain perfection in mysticism. It is possible, right? A person may give up, suddenly he may be attached to some, get attracted to something else and think that is the best thing to do in life. So uh, we have seen the example, you know, of how Bharat Maharaja, such a great devotee of the Lord, towards the end of his life, he was attracted to the deer, you know, like the baby deer and... Uh, though he was on such a high platform. So it could happen to anybody. So Arjuna's question is, what, what is the destination? You know? So is it all gone to zero, back to zero now? I mean, all this hard effort I put in, what's going to happen? So, oh, mighty Am Krishna, does not such a man who is bewildered from the path of transcendence fall away from both spiritual and material success and perish like a ribbon cloud with no position in any sphere? So this is the fear that Arjuna is having. So the ribbon cloud basically means, you know, like when there's a group of clouds and then one small piece, you know, one small cloud just goes away, you know, gets lost like that, right? And it disappears like that. So he's thinking that what if a person falls down from this path, you know, and then uh, of transcendence and he perishes like a ribbon cloud. So he says, Krishna, what will happen to such a person, you know, and after putting in so much effort, suddenly, you know, he gets... Uh, distracted and he perishes like a cloud. So we see what Krishna has to tell in this regard. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, O son of Pratha, a transcendentalist engaged in auspicious activities does not meet with destruction, either in this world or in the spiritual world. One who does good, my friend, is never overcome by evil. This is 640. Yeah, the un, so and then he goes on to describe the two kinds of unsuccessful yogis, the persons who try to engage in yoga, first and second stage again here. So the first stage, the unsuccessful yogi who falls down or he gets distracted or he gets deviated 
you know, from the yogic practice after a short practice, not for, he's not been practicing for too long. What happens to him? He attains the planets of the pious and, and uh, enjoys there for many years. So this is referring to like Swargaloka and, you know, planet where there's a lot of enjoyment. Then he takes birth in the house of a righteous, Shutinam Srimatam Gehi. That is the verse, okay? He takes birth in, a, in the house of a righteous or wealthy people. Um, that is, that's, that's the destination for a person who has actually done a short uh, span of yoga practice. And for a person who is unsuccessful uh, after his practice for a long time, what does he do? He takes birth in the family of great wise yogis or he takes birth, as she proposes, in the family of transcendentalists. So when he's born in this uh, family of transcendentalists, he can easily take to the path of devotion service. Srila Prabhupada, in the purport, he gives the example very humbly of himself and his Guru Maharaj, that they were born in devotional families. So it was easy for them to practice this devotional service right from the very young age. So these are the two destinations described by Lord Krishna here. When such a yogi endeavors for perfection, being washed of all contaminations, he ultimately achieves the supreme goal of liberation after many births of practice. So you see this after, it's not like one lifetime, it's like so many uh, uh, births of practice, you know, he takes to uh, achieve this kind of a liberation. And then Krishna concludes with this great famous verse, Yogi nama pi sarvesha madgate nantaratmana shraddhavan bhajate yo maam same yukta tamo mataha. So, in the uh, final verse, Krishna very uh, nicely concludes Of all the yogis, the one who always abides in me thinks of me within, uh, thinks of Krishna within himself, worships and renders bhajate. It is, he does devotional service, shraddhavan bhajate worships and renders service unto Krishna with great faith. Same yukta tamo mataha is mostly united. Tamo means it is referring to most, okay? Yukta tamo mataha. Mataha, it is his, uh, uh, Krishna's opinion. It's mostly united with me in yoga. So that is the conclusion of Lord Sri Krishna here that the devotee, you know, the, uh, he very clearly says that a person who worships and renders service unto me with great service, the, uh, with great faith, that is the definition of a devotee, right? So a person who engages in devotional service is the greatest devotee of the Supreme Person. And, I mean, is the greatest yogi, uh, not any person who is just engaging in some gymnastics or uh, engaging in some fruitive sacrifices or, you know, engaged in, in speculative uh, knowledge, not that, but a person who is engaged in bhakti, bhakti yoga is actually the greatest yogi of all. This is the final conclusion given by Lord Krishna. There's also another verse which we have not included where Lord, let me see if it comes, no, this is take home. Yeah, where Lord Krishna says that this yogi he is actually greater, he is higher than an ascetic, he is higher than an empiricist. Empiricist is a jnani. And then he is also higher than a karma yogi. He clearly says in one of the verses here. Okay, we will stop here and we look at the takeaway points. Uh, this, um, which says, without mind control, any form of yoga is a waste of time and we can control it with abhyasena, Vairagya, okay, detachment and suitable practices. For one who controls his senses and mind, Paramatma is already reached, the super soul is already reached. When he starts to render devotional service to Krishna, the transcendentalist, he realizes the Supreme Lord. He is at peace with everybody and he's at peace himself, inside himself. The yogi is better than a karmi, jnani, or a tapasvi. And the best yogi of all of them is a devotee. So there is just another slide with the few verses, if anybody is interested. These are, uh, th there are only three verses. We, we, of course, all the verses are beautiful in Bhagavad Gita. But three main important verses, if anybody is, uh, you know, inspired to learn or memorize, 617, 614, and 647. So I would like to uh, stop here.
I just uh, forgot to express my gratitude. So all these slides were uh, prepared by um, uh, great devotees with us. Uh, her Grace Lalita Angi Radha Mataji, uh, Her Grace Radhika Mataji and Preeti Mataji. So they gave it all to me on a platter. <laughs> so some size, if you see me wondering what's happening, uh, it's because you know I was given everything. And so I owe my gratitude to all these great devotees who are actually helping me uh, uh, deliver the content. So I'm just uh, an instrument in the hands of these great devotees and I'm grateful to them for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak a few words. Uh, thank you so much, and please forgive me if I have said anything out of context or wrong, and um, please forgive me for that. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Mataji, wonderful, wonderful class. It was so sweet, like your uh, music, and of course, I wanted to say it was your flow and uh, you have uh, taken the may studied and researched and taken the poems and we just uh, added some things here and there. But uh, main credit goes to you, Mataji. Thank you so much for your wonderful explanation, time and efforts. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji, for your kind encouragement. <laughs> I know you just saying, but I know like you all did the thing. So I'm so grateful to all of you. So thank you so much for this uh, beautiful class, Mataji. It was very nice. Uh, with so many examples and connecting points and making it uh, very easy uh, to understand this chapter. Uh, so if anyone has any questions or comments for Mataji, uh, you can please go ahead now. Hare Krishna, uh, Hare Krishna. Um, please accept my humble obeisances. I just wanted to thank you for a lovely class. I learned a lot from your from your explanations. It was very clear and a lot of things I had questions about. Um, they're clearing up for me. Of course, I'm not um, gonna understand everything, but you know, you made it very clear for me so I can go back and um, study and, and read. So I wanted to thank you very much for your patience and your time. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mantaji. I'm also learning in the process. I it's never complete, is it? I mean, scriptures, they're so deep in realizations. Thank you for your association, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Suksagari Mataji. Thank you, Mataji, for the beautiful, beautiful classes as, as every time that you do. Thank you so much. Very, very grateful to you. I really like the uh, pastime that you were sharing about these senses want to you know do their individual thing at the end they are only going to suffer so if we are not uh, thinking that we want to do our own thing leaving krishna aside then finally we are going to suffer so uh, that was very nice that Prabhupada taught us in a simple way Mataji, that you uh, made um, uh, you know put it again so that we remember that we should not forget krishna thank you so much Mataji. thank you Mataji. You are always serving in a service mode. So you're like the backbone, you know. Hare Krishna Mataji Danvat Prana. Thank you so much, Mataji, for wonderful class. Mataji, I have one question. Can you like explain a little more about that Yukta Vairagya? Yeah, Yukta Vairagya, um, this concept is uh, actually explained in great detail in uh, again in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Um, and uh, basically the uh, concept of Yukta, Yukta Vairagya, Yukta is, um, you know, to use something. Vairagya is, you know, renunciation. So what is the meaning of this Yukta Vairagya? Yukta Vairagya means not that we actually falsely give up material things. For example, um, um, 
you know, Srila Prabhupada, he tried to use, I mean, when somebody used to give donations for the purpose of, uh, you know, constructing temples or, uh, you know, like for preaching service, Prabhupada never said a no. He told the devotees, he trained them that take all these donations and use them in the service of Krishna. After all these resources, though we may think somebody is giving us, you know, or somebody is making a charity, whose is it in the end? It is actually given to us by Krishna, right? Everything is Krishna's property. So it should actually go back to Lord Krishna, right? To his service. So yeah. Prabhupada never discouraged or he never said, no, don't give me any money. I'm a sadhu. I'm a renunciate. I'm not going to touch Lakshmi. No, he was not doing that. So a devotee knows very nicely how to use everything in the service of the Supreme Lord. Like, uh, um, uh, you know, anything. Like if we see the whole... Uh, uh, you know, system of uh, ISKCON, we see that uh, Prabhupada has actually tried to use many of our uh, different, um, you know, abilities or faculties which we may have, how we can use them for uh, the service of Krishna. For example, you know, if you are a great cook, you can always cook for Krishna, right? You can make nice prasadam, nice bhoga for the Lord and distribute prasadam to everybody. If you're good at singing or if you're good at preaching, if you're good at talking, why don't we go and distribute some books, right? Like that. So everything, every faculty which we are blessed with, we can actually use in the service of Krishna. So Prabhupada has provided us this way, you know, by which nothing is considered material in one sense. Everything, you know, which can be used uh, for the service of Krishna automatically becomes spirit, spiritualized. Uh, and there is this, uh, uh, this verse, Chatur uh, Shloki in the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, which gives the definition of Maya, Rithe Artham Yat Pratiyata Na Pratiyata Chatmani. So it says that, you know, without Rithe Artham Yat Pratiyata, so without any relationship to Krishna, anything uh, that is without any relationship to Krishna is actually Maya. And anything which is related to Krishna is actually spiritual. So in that sense, um, a devotee, if he can utilize like the simple example of microphone is given, you know, like uh, this microphone um, or this dictaphone, which Srila Prabhupada used to actually record his um, translations or his purports he used this microphone to actually uh, uh, give us so much, so many of the scriptures, you know. So when um, a devotee sees such technology or such things, he does not rubbish it away and say that, oh, I'm not going to use this, you know, this is a modern technology like that. But the devotee takes it in the right perspective and sees how he or she can use that modern technology also in the service of Krishna. So for example, now Zoom call is going on everywhere. But uh, devotees are so nicely taking advantage of this COVID situation. And in fact, what I hear is more preaching is happening, you know, uh, through these Zoom calls, more because people for several reasons are working at home and, you know, they don't, they have no uh, outside engagements, they're not able to socialize, not able to go out, and they're looking for some outlet. And so they're logging on to these, you know, uh, Zoom sessions and trying to get the most. So this in Though, you know, outwardly we may think that COVID, of course, it is, uh, uh, you know, has had some detrimental effects. I wouldn't underplay that. But in another uh, point of view, if we see that preaching efforts have gone up, you know, in that way. And a uh, and lot of people we have seen during this past year have taken to the Bhakti Sangha call itself. You know, we see so many people logging in. It has really increased during the past year. So like that, the devotee can see every situation uh, as an opportunity to serve the Lord. So he doesn't consider anything uh, like material, you know. Uh, that's what the verse says in uh, 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 in the Bhaktir Samrita Sindhu, that uh, uh, if a devotee, you know, says, that, oh, this is material and I will not use it, it is Vairagyam Phalgu Kathete. Phalgu means like it's very shallow. It's not actually renunciation, but it is um, it, it's, it's a shallow tendency because everything and anything, a, a devotee, you know, can, has the right perspective to put everything in the service of Krishna. So I hope I'm getting across the point to you, Mataji. Yes, Mataji. Very nice, Mataji. So deep. Yes. Yeah. 
Thank yeah, you so much. This is the principle Srila Prabhupada has uh, actually, you know, instituted. If you see, like, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu also discusses, like, five main uh, uh, activities or limbs of devotional service. So one is like Bhagavad Katha chanting and then, you know, uh, um, uh, doing deity service yes. and then uh, uh, residing in the Dham. And uh, what is the other one? Kirtan? Uh, reading Bhagavatam scriptures. Reading Bhagavatam. Yeah, Bhagavatam in yes. the Association of Devotees. So all these activities, you know, can keep us engaged in one way or the other throughout the day, if we see. So it's very clear, cleverly devised plan, you know, it's a whole lifestyle plan, which is given to us by uh, Srila Prabhupada. And um, of course, coming from the line of Acharyas. So we are very blessed in that way that, you know, every opportunity we see around us, we can try to use in the service of Krishna. Um, you know, like I know like some uh, Matajis or some Prabhujis, they have this heightened sense of, you know, uh, um, of, um, Shringar, you know, like uh, the the decoration or, you know, like they have such good, uh, uh, what do I say, um, intuitions, how to match colors, how to, you know, uh, match outfits with uh, jewelry and things like that. And they, I see that such devotees do so beautiful alankar of the Lord. I mean, all the faculties can be used that way in the service of the Lord. So, um, so, so in that sense, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, if somebody is very interested in, uh, you know, uh, buying jewelry or, you know, who, uh, somebody is very interested to look for outfits or things like that, they could invest these interests in the service of the Supreme Lord, you know, and uh, thus make it all transcendental. It becomes transcendental. And that way, you know, dovetail. So Srila Prabhupada always used this special word dovetail. So dovetail all our activities towards the service of the Supreme Lord. So that's like the beginning phase, um, you know, when we um, are kind of still attached to our activities. And um, at that time, we that is that uh, Nishkama platform, but you know, we are not so attached to the fruits, but still we are kind of attached to the activities. You know, I like to do only cooking, so let me cook for Krishna. So that stage we can always utilize, you know, and slowly purify ourselves like that. So the devotee is uh, Yukta Vairagi. He doesn't falsely give up, you know, like Prabhupada could have very well stayed in Vrindavan, you know. He was in Vrindavan before he came to the Americas. He could have very well done that, but why did he have to take all the trouble and come here, you know? He could have said, I'm not going to cross this uh, ocean and go, you know, like sannyasis generally, they don't do that. But uh, devotee takes everything as an opportunity to serve the Lord. So if Prabhupada was not here, I don't know. I never got into Krishna consciousness uh, in India. Uh, I came to Krishna consciousness only in the US. I don't know where I would be. So uh, devotee, pure devotee, they know how to utilize everything, every opportunity in the service of mm -hmm. Yeah, No, thank you. Thank you so much, Mataz. Yes, if Prabhupada na hoi to, to pata nahi where we are. Thank you so much, Mataji. Very nice answer. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Mataji. Uh, can I just add something? Oh, sure, Mataji, please. This Mataji who asked the question, Devahuti Mataji, she's expert at dressing the deities. Every day she bathes and dresses her Radha Krishna deities and, and dresses them so nicely. Like as you said, the matching colors and the, and the patterns and the jewelry and the so amazing is her uh, devotion and her talent for uh, 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 serving the lordships every single day. Thank you so much, Mataji, for your association. And uh, because of you, uh, your inspiration, we are also inspired to follow and serve the deities nicely. Yeah, Hari, she... Hari, Bol. Oh, yeah. Hari. Yes. She shares yeah, pictures with me every now and then. So I am I feel very blessed. At the same time, so embarrassed that I'm doing absolutely nothing. Uh, I mean, Mataji is on that level and uh, it's, it's so inspiring to me. So thank you so much, Mataji, for your kind association. Oh, Mataji, please. No, I'm nothing, Mataji. I, seriously, I don't even, I don't know what to say. Thank you. Just please bless me, like, you know, I, I don't know what to say. Thank you so much for like the association. Like, you know, I don't know before I was like 
so shy i couldn't ask the question like you know in english and like all that so but then but like you know i see all you all you mata ji like so inspiring then and I, i feel like no I, if i ask the question then i can get you know more inspiration and all that so was it's seriously thank you so much you all mata ji are really i sometimes i imagine how could all you mata ji like are managing all this stuff this bhakti sangat group is like all the mata ji are really really like so wonderful i don't know how they are managing i didn't know because my kids come in that class bhakti sangha kids class and then i join in the like in our group but this is really so amazing mata ji i really really like oh, thank you so much that's it hari I, I don't know what to say thank you hari krishna thank you thank Even you mata ji Yeah, I don't know how the Mataji's manage. That's my question, day in and day out. Too, I totally get you. Yes, yeah, this is so amazing. Thank you, thank you so much yeah. for that, Mataji. Thank you, Devoti Mataji. Maybe very soon we'll hear from you also a class. Uh, uh, you know, you can also enlighten us, sharing your realizations. <laughs> thank you. Maybe a beauty dressing workshop or something for a fool like me, Mataji. I really. <laughs> I, I maybe I don't know. <laughs> yes, Mata. If I, if Radha Goindji give me a chance, I will definitely. What I I'm not talented as you all, Mata Ji. But uh, whatever I know about the singer, I can really happy to share. But thank you. Thank you, Mata. Is four minutes to nine. Does anybody else have questions or comments? Mukund and uh, Kanchan, you have raised your hand. Do you want to say something? Hello, Krishna Mataji. Um, this is Mukund. Hi, Krishna. Uh, I really liked the, in today's class on the uh, sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, and um, in one part we were talking a lot about like the yoga and about yogi. So one question popped up in my head that uh. Why do yogis med, um like meditate to go on? Um, why do yogi? Why do the yogis meditate to go to the Brahma Jyoti when uh because Brahma Jyoti is just light. So why do they meditate to go there? Yeah, uh, basically the yoga which we saw in chapter six, the meditation happens on the super soul. but yeah there are some new modern age uh, you know yogic medications which meditations you know where they say meditation on the blank or meditate on nothing or meditate on some light source things like they are all you know in one sense uh, they are all um, what do they say adulterated forms of yoga so this yoga which we see in chapter 6 is to meditate on the four handed super soul you know sitting in the heart so that is the meditation which is actually being discussed in chapter 6 does that answer your question mukund yeah the other forms of meditation are adulterated versions which are going around um do you have something more to say confused why did i am a little confused mm-hmm. oh, i'm sorry if i confused you I don't know do other mathajis want to answer his question I don't know if I confused the little boy I'm sorry for that uh, Hare Krishna mathaji can I add Yeah yeah please go ahead So Mukunta so why do those people go is because uh, that is that is what their desire is So Krishna he doesn't interfere with the desire of that person who's a yogi and who wants to do ashtanga yoga and go to Brahma Jyoti okay Uh, if that is what he wants then krishna he says okay no problem i will grant you that and he makes him go there so ye etamam prabatyante right we studied and uh, that krishna he just fulfills whatever we desire based on our desire he he just doesn't interfere oh no no you should only uh, come and b- worship the bhagavan aspect that is not something that the yogi uh, that krishna does okay if the yogi wants some personal liberation then he makes him go to brahma jyoti if the yogi he wants to have a relationship with the lord 
or i mean if a devotee he wants to have relationship with the lord accordingly he does that he doesn't interfere with anybody okay yes madhuri thank you madhuri that answers my question okay hare krishna thank you madhuri hare krishna thank you madhuri. Thank you Sukhasari Mataji for the beautiful presentation really enjoyed the flow and the narration and the way you were taking us all through different topics totally enjoyed it hare krishna all glory to mataji to your service yeah, thanks to all your slides radhika mataji no no not at all mataji thank you so much hare krishna wonderful class sukhasari mataji So yeah, if uh, nobody has any questions, Mataji Barsana, Bar Barsana Rani. Ah uh, uh, yeah, Mataji, she she was speaking. Yes, Mataji, very wonderful class, and uh, uh, every uh, verse by verse you explain so thoroughly, and uh, like a very important verse is Chanchala Ha Manoha Krishna, you know. So and you already explained that nicely. and i really really enjoy uh, this uh, whole chapter because this is the uh, uh, dhyana yoga is a uh, first section of the sixth chapter so sixth chapter sixth chapter is the last chapter in this first uh, session in bhagavad gita three session every sixth chapter and then another sixth chapter bhakti yoga then another sixth chapter so uh, this is the last chapter of this first session and all the very important knowledge about the yoga dhyana uh, everything everything what krishna has to say about the yoga and dhyan he said everything in this chapter and then uh, uh, arjun has a uh, confusion always uh, and krishna is uh, said or said arjun say chanchala ha mana krishna pramadi balavad dhatam tasyaham nigraham manye vayo riva sudhuskaram so then uh, the mind is restless turbulent obstinate and very strong o krishna and so subdued it i think is more difficult than controlling the wind so that uh, and then krishna is giving the answer from the next verse Uh, krishna says the lord krishna says o oh, mighty arm son of kunti it is undoubtedly very difficult to curb the restless mind but it is possible by suitable practice and by detachment so uh, this words these two words very important because krishna here said abhyase na tu kanteya so by detachment and by suitable practice you can conquer your mind so this is a very important you already explained that and i really really very enjoy this chapter because um, how to sit how to chanting what is our posture how to sit how much the eyes supposed to be closed if we close our eyes we feel fell in sleeping and if we leave our eyes whole eyes open we see all around things and our mind not get concentrate so we have to close our half eyes and concentrate on the tip of the nose and uh, sitting in a very steady straight so our face and our belly and our whole body supposed to be straight you know and um, make our mind peaceful as much as we can so we can concentrate on the supreme lord and we can chant and meditate so a lot of thing we have to we learn this from this chapter and this all this uh, instruction in this chapter we have to remember this forever because we going to chanting we are chanting not for one day two day we going to chanting the lord on the meditate on supreme lord until the day we die if we can you know so we have to practice 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 and so we have to lot of thing we have to remember from this chapter so that's all i have to say mata ji thank you thank you so much mata ji mere bhi barsana mata ji barsana rani is 
a very uh, senior devotee into Krishna consciousness for such a long time. She does so much seva. She, um, you know, Dhokla and Khanvi just like that, you know, and um, for Lord Krishna and her mother and father are also, you know, like the Mataji is there in the video. You can see her, Hare Krishna Mataji, Danvar Pranam. And uh, her father and mother also, uh, her father is no more, but uh, they used to, in, they engage in the uh, study of Bhag Bhagavatam every day. So um, such very uh, great devotees. So nice to hear from you, Mataji. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji. Oh, very nice to see you, Mataji. You're from Houston, I remember. Yeah. Yeah, she, she'll cook like that in five minutes for Guru Maharaj. Like, like a whirlwind, she'll come and she'll cook and leave in like 20 minutes like that. <laughs> Experts, yeah. Is there anybody have any more questions for Mataji or realization? Okay, if there are no more questions, we can uh, end the call here. I would like to offer my obeisances to Mataji and all the Vaishnavas assembled here. Vancha Kalpa Taropiasya Kripa Sindhu Bhye Vajya Patitanam Pavani Bhye Vajya Vaishnavadya Namaha Namaha Anantha Kuti Vaishnavadya Kija Yashupal Kija Thank you Mataji Kadari Mataji Kija Hari Bol Thank you Mataji Mataji Thank you so much Happy Ram Navami to everyone See you all in tomorrow's morning chanting. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.